Namaste. Well, that was quite a weekend. Whew. We had Venus conjunct Pluto, and uh, I mean, it was just wild. <laughs> anyway, it's over now, but wow, it was a great ride while well, it lasted. Anyway, um, you know, we talk about consciousness a lot on this channel, and of course, Everything we say is based on Vedas and Upanishads. Um, there isn't much about consciousness in the later Vedic literature, such as the Puranas, Mahabharata, and like that. Although they're more popular, more well-known than the Upanishads and the original Vedas. They don't really have much to say about consciousness. That falls to the Upanishads, which are foundational, basic knowledge about consciousness and the ontology of Vedic existence. What do we mean by ontology? A background framework of knowledge, terminology, and definitions that provides a language to analyze our experience according to actual natural law. Okay, we could say God's law or natural law. It's the same thing. But in the world today, if you try to have a conversation with somebody about consciousness, likely as not, they'll come up with some bogus theory about consciousness, which they expect us to accept, and to, it takes the place of a real theory. But what is a real theory versus a bogus theory? A real theory is something anybody can verify. A bogus theory is unverifiable or unfalsifiable, to use the precise scientific term. Falsification of a theory is when an experiment contradicts the predictions made by the theory and forces the theorist to reconsider and basically edit, amend, or fix <laughs> the model generated by the theory. So in the Upanishads, we have a model of consciousness based on these four states. Here's the good old diagram this table of the four states of consciousness as given in Mandukya Upanishad and other Upanishads as well. But in Mandukya, it sees its full expression. It's very wonderful. And this is the real theory of consciousness. So what do you do when somebody in a conversation starts mumbling about epiphenomena and brain function and neurological this and psychological that? Well, it's very simple. You ask them, everybody is conscious. Everyone experiences consciousness every day. So how can any person who has consciousness validate your theory can they replicate the experiments that led to this theory? Or is the theory itself falsifiable by any experiment? This is a real clincher. But let's say, let's say we have a theory of gravity. Can we verify that theory? Well, yeah, you, you just pick something up and let it go and it drops. Theory confirmed. It's valid. It works for everybody, every time, anywhere. Or let's say something else, uh, theory of water. Say water always flows to the lowest point, something like that. Is that easily verifiable? Oh yeah, just go out in your garden with a, a bucket of water and maybe a little shovel or a spade or something, 
and pour some water on the ground and cut some channels and watch it flow downhill. It does it every single time. I can completely verify my theory just in my backyard with simple tools or electricity. If we want to verify Ohm's law, which is a theory, uh, E equals IR squared, all you have to do is get a battery and a resistor and maybe a little light bulb or something and a simple multimeter that costs 25 bucks at your local flea market. And you can verify Ohm's law and all of the theories that rely on it. So, Mr. Consciousness Expert, <laughs> how do we verify your theory? Well, first of all, you have to have a PhD or neuropsychology, uh, and then uh, you have to have a lab full of expensive equipment like EEGs and EKGs and this Gs and that Gs. <laughs> Jeez, man. <laughs> How are we supposed to verify this theory? How are we to duplicate the experiments, especially that supposedly support this theory or led to this theory as a deduction? Can anybody do that? No. So, this theory is falsified on its face. I told you I'd get to falsification, which is a big deal. This theory is falsified on its face by the inability of the average person who is subject to it, huh? consciousness, but they can't verify the theory. They can't confirm that it works. They can neither verify it nor falsify it based on the experiments because they don't have access to the experiments, either by lack of education or lack of equipment or facilities or money. So this is a bogus theory. It's science fiction. <laughs> it's something that the scientists would like to be true. And so they talk it up and they provide a bunch of meaningless references which the average person can never check or verify. Hiding the proof, in other words, that the theory is, whether, whether it's correct or incorrect, they're hiding the experimental proof behind a, a wall of unreadable scientific papers. See, and all this technical research stuff. This is bogus. If I experience consciousness, there should be a theory of consciousness that allows me to verify it in real time. So what are we saying? There are four states of consciousness. Sensory consciousness, external consciousness, internal consciousness of thoughts, consciousness of nothing, and finally, transcendental consciousness, awareness of awareness. So all you have to do to verify this theory is ask yourself, am I aware of being aware? And if the answer is no, uh, you might as well take yourself to the hospital because you died. <laughs> Oh, no, just go straight to the funeral. What the hell? <laughs> you dead, man. If you're not aware of being aware, for all practical purposes, you're not conscious. But if you are, that means you are in Turiya, because that's what Turiya is. Awareness of awareness. Consciousness of consciousness. When Turiya has an object. It doesn't need an object, by the way. Turiya is perfectly fine all by itself. But when Turiya does have an object, its objects are the other states of consciousness. So this is awareness of awareness, consciousness of consciousness. And this awareness of awareness is the substrate, the cause or the origin 
of the other states of consciousness that do have objects. And for example, in ordinary Jagrat consciousness, the objects are the senses and all the objects revealed by the senses. In Svapna consciousness, it's dreams and thoughts and other objects within the mind. And in Sushupti consciousness, there is no object itself, but objectlessness, <laughs> emptiness, nothingness. That is Sushupti, deep sleep consciousness. And we already covered Turiya, the fourth. Just observe yourself. You experience all four of these states every day. Actually, all the time. If you observe yourself closely, for example, right now I'm sitting here in the room, and my external Jagrat consciousness is aware of the room and the surrounding environment and the light and the camera and what I'm saying and so on like that. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, or rather observing with my mind, my actual state of consciousness at the moment, which is kind of mixed because I have Jagrat going. I also have Svapna going because I'm thinking about what I have to say. Not a whole lot because it's pretty obvious. So really, I'm just observing, analyzing my current experience and talking about it. But still, that's Svapna, and it's going at the same time internally as my talking and so on is going on externally. And then finally, I'm not thinking about a whole bunch of things. I'm not aware of a whole bunch of things. Because I'm concentrating on my speaking and thinking to make this a good video, <laughs> I'm not aware of so many other things that I could be thinking of what I'm going to have for lunch, uh, the feeling of sitting on the chair, uh, it's a nice cool day with beautiful weather, you know, and all of that just fades into the background as if it's not there. This is Sushupti. We also call this the subconscious or the collective unconscious, but it is the mind of emptiness. And it is pure intentionality, pure creative will. And then we have Turiya, which is awareness of awareness, consciousness of consciousness. And so I'm seeing all these things. So all four states of consciousness are active at all times for everyone. It's not just me. You take any average person and you quiz them and you find out these things are going on in their consciousness as well. So it's easy to verify. It's easy to prove by simple observation of oneself. Then the scientists will say, oh, that's subjective evidence. That's not valid. We can't use that. We can only use evidence that is, you know, observed by machines and stuff like that. <laughs> which is ridiculous, because the nature of consciousness is always subjective. Always, always, always. It's never objective. It cannot be seen, because it is the seer. There's this wonderful shloka I'm going to close with from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad that says, when there is duality, as it were, in other words, when there is the appearance, the illusory appearance of duality, <laughs> then we can see things with the eye, we can hear things with the ears, smell and taste with the nose and tongue, feel by touch, and we can know so many things in the mind and so on. But when we realize that Brahman is everything. Brahman and Turiya are functionally identical. So when we realize that everything is Turiya, everything is Brahman, then 
What is there to see and through what? What is there to hear and through what? What is there to smell, taste, and touch, and so on, and through what? In other words, the so-called object is actually identical with the subject, <laughs> Brahman. And only Brahman can see itself. And itself is all it needs to see. And so it doesn't see any of these other things. Or it doesn't need to. It can, but, you know, there's no actual need for it. So in that case, how can we know that by which everything else is known? How can we know the knower? And the conclusion is we can't. We can't know it, but we can observe it. And that is the proof of the Vedic theory of consciousness. Aum Tat Sat. <laughs> Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>